Hi, I'm Hannah Wilson. I tweet and blog as Ethical Leader. I'm a former head teacher and currently the head of a PGCE for university. My presentation today is on a whole school approach to mental health and well-being. So if you were the founding head teacher of a brand new school and had a clean slate, what would you do differently? This was the question I asked myself when I became the founding head teacher of a school that was not yet built. I had no team, no children, no parents. Um, it was an interesting concept. I really went back to the drawing board and sort of rethought what are all the things I've inherited throughout my career? What are the things that are broken that I try to fix? And actually, what can we do differently from the get go to get a different outcome um, as an end result? So we had clean sheets of paper. Um, the first appointments I made as a, as a founding head, because I was, I was still in post at the time as a deputy head in a different county as well, um, was to appoint my deputy heads. And the three of us spent many a Saturday afternoon in the summer term, um, sort of like juggling our current responsibilities and our different schools with big A3 flip sheets, um, scribbling down notes and ideas and keywords, and just really capturing our thoughts and formulating a bit of a plan. What we really wanted to be um, at the centre of all of our decision making was child centred. Um, we talked a lot about whole child development and a holistic approach to education so that children would no longer be reduced to being numbers in spreadsheets, that there'd be individual human beings with individual needs and we'd personalise and bespoke what we're doing to meet their needs rather than trying to compartmentalise them into different categories. Some of the non-negotiables we decided quite early on were things that we felt created a lot of undue stress and anxiety in schools. Um, those of you who have been in schools, when the bell goes, you feel every single bone in your body shudder and jar. Um, your ears ring for ages afterwards. Schools can be quite frenetic when you have six, seven, eight, sometimes very short um, lessons and you have to change classrooms, um, move buildings, and particularly for like year sevens transitioning from primary school, it's extremely stressful. Um, it also means that for a 45 minute lesson, you probably get 30 minutes worth of learning by the time you get them in and get them out. Setting has um, had a lot of research done in that kind of sphere recently, but setting um, doesn't have perhaps the progress um, variables that people think it has. And what kind of um, culture and mindset are we creating and projecting if we label people by what ability they are? Equally with homework, there's research that shows that homework doesn't have very much impact directly on learning. Um, actually, it creates a lot of stress, it creates a lot of um, behaviour issues, it starts lessons off negatively, it causes arguments at home. So we rethought what we wanted home learning to look like. As I mentioned, like homework also creates behaviour issues. I literally spent my deputy headship um, doing detentions on a Friday afternoon for 200 kids. I'd pick them all up, put them in the hall, they'd sit in silence, I'd tick them all off, but none of them really knew why they were there. Um, when you track back on the system, they might have missed a homework four weeks ago, missed a 15 minute detention, missed a 30 minute detention, missed a 45 minute detention. I just think some of our behaviour and sanction systems are really flawed in our schools. And no shouting. This one might seem as common sense as it does. Um, unfortunately, I've worked in a lot of schools where the default setting is for adults to overpower um, children and enforce behaviour by raising their voice and by being quite confrontational. We knew that we were going to have a particularly vulnerable um, cohort because startup schools tend to attract more SEND and more CP. Um, so we made a commitment to not raise our voices, not to shout um, in the building. So we really thought from a big picture, blue sky thinking kind of perspective. What were our ideals? What do we want the school to look and feel like in five years time when it was full? Um, and how are we going to scale things back rather than falling into that trap of starting small and then keep having to change plans as we scaled up? So I'm going to talk you through now some of the decisions we made, those sort of child centred decisions about our whole education provision. So we made a commitment um, from the day the school opened to have mindfulness as part of our daily practice. I've worked in a lot of schools where tutor time's first thing in the morning. It can be quite stressful. Children can arrive late. It's all about uniform and planners and stationery. Um, and actually, a lot of children don't have a mindful start to their day. Dogs barking, siblings screaming, mum and dad shouting. So we wanted to settle children as they arrived in the morning to really enable and empower them to go into their first lesson in a in a ready state for learning. 
Well, the flip of that was that we ended our week on a Friday. So we had a we had a four and a half day week structure. We finished early on a Friday um, so families could have some family time. But we finished the week with weekly gratitude practice, um, just really modelling to the children everything they should and could be grateful for, um, which sometimes is not a mindset we see in the younger generations in particular. I've mentioned the reduction of white noise. We had a, a lot of children with autism, with sensory um, issues. We had a beautiful big um, new build building, but it was very architecturally, aesthetically pleasing, big open spaces, lots of white, lots of echoes. Um, the noise kind of reverberated around the building. So just by not having bells um, made a big difference. We wanted to have um, a music system installed so that we could have classical music playing at lesson transition. Unfortunately, there was a flaw in the design fault and then we didn't have the budget to do it. But longer term, that would have been my plan to use classical music as a kind of a, a settling activity and to set the tone as children move between lessons. Our school food policy was um, a big decision we made. Um, a lot of schools outsource their food education, their food services to uh, external catering um, operations. I've worked in schools where the food being served is just shocking. Portion sizes aren't great. Prices are quite high. It's basically profiteering from the children. Um, we had a very high percentage of children with um, entitled to food school meal, free school meals. So we made a pledge to um, everyone sitting down and having a home cooked um, or home cooked equivalent healthy hot meal every day. Um, so along with that agreement, we banned packed lunches, which caused a lot more controversy than I thought it would. So um, as part of the kind of the lunchtime experience, we wanted to model family values. I've worked in a lot of um, urban state schools where I've worked with 15, 16 year olds who can't hold a knife and fork. Um, and we really wanted to kind of like model how we interact at the dining table. We drink water, we use knife and forks, we converse. Um, when I first had the building side over to me, we had like long trestle tables with benches. I sent all the furniture back and replaced it with round tables, as you can see here, so that we could sit in a circle, an adult on each table, eight children, um, and really develop those key relationships during our lunch times. I've mentioned homework already. So for um, Key Stage 3, we didn't set any formal homework that was sent home. Instead, we extended the school day and there was an optional 45 minutes each night. And we had an absolutely amazing offer um, of extracurricular activities. We had children learning Mandarin, um, learning how to box, how to fence. We had a photography club. So anything you can imagine. Um, it was about learning um, new skills, meeting new people, that kind of personal development pledge, as opposed to going home, filling in a worksheet. As part of our commitment to a kind of a culture of well-being, we also decided um, not to have detentions. So our rewards and sanctions policy was actually called the cultural well-being policy, um, and it was underpinned by restorative practice. So every adult in the building was trained in how to have a restorative conversation, how to um, influence and change behaviour in a affirmative, um, positive reinforcement way rather than in a deficit model. And we led with rewards. So we had a, a, a rewards hierarchy where they could get a sticker or a postcard or a certificate or a prize. But the 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 reward that absolutely went down the best was the weekly hot, cho hot chocolate with the head teacher. So each week um, a number of children were nominated because they'd shown the value of the week. They'd get a certificate and an invitation. Um, and then my catering manager would make a round of hot chocolate and biscuits and marshmallows. And they come and have hot chocolate with me or a member of the senior leadership team. And they absolutely loved it, as you can see by the smiles on their faces. And I loved it too. So because I do a lot of work with girls um, who have self-esteem issues, I had a group of year eight girls who lacked in confidence. And there were eight of them. And we met once a week and we talked through strategies um, on how to um, raise their self-esteem um, and how to have more confidence in their skills and qualities and ambitions. Creating safe spaces in a school um, is really key. Um, we had different rooms for different needs um, and because we were a brand new building and quite a spacious building and we only had one year group in the first year, um, we knew that we could utilise spaces in different ways, um, particularly in the early years. So, for example, creating a room where um, LGBTQI 
children could meet once a week um, with uh, adult champion ambassador to talk through any identity issues was really important. One of our safe spaces was the nurture room. Um, so we had a lot of um, vulnerable children for various different needs, lots of um, mental health and wellbeing concerns. Um, so we had a pastoral team, a support staff team, who um, were basically based in a room where the children could self-refer for one-to-ones. It was kind of a home for home, just somewhere very safe and secure um, for them to go to during the day. We also had a sensory room. So as I said, we had a lot of children with um, autism, sensory issues in particular. So we allocated a room that was very odd. It had no windows in it. I don't know what it was, what it was supposed to be for. Um, but we painted it black and we kitted it out. And that was our sensory room where our TAs were trained up on how to take um, particular children there um, for regular um, 10 minute slots for their senses just, senses just to be um, sort of like co-regulated. We also had a Thrive Room. So the Thrive Programme um, is quite big in a lot of primary schools. And we were one of the first secondary schools, definitely the first secondary school in our trust, um, to train up to Thrive practitioners. So this is my deputy head, Julie, and art teacher, Laura. Um, and Laura actually made this beautiful room for us. So you pick a theme, and our theme was going to the beach. Um, and it's a, just a safe space where children could come for one-to-ones with a Thrive practitioner. The reason why there's a check in the picture here is that for a number of these space, safe spaces, we had a very limited budget, but we had a lot of space. So I basically leveraged um, partnerships um, and I gave free space to organisations who then in exchange um, gave us money for various projects. So Kitbox were our uniform supplier who designed our lovely uniform from scratch with us. Um, we did quite a lot of marketing for them um, and in exchange they then sponsored one of our rooms and there was a plaque outside the Thrive Room saying sponsored by Kitbox. One of the spaces um, I, we denoted was um, an art therapy room. So there's a, there's a brilliant um, charity called The Art Room um, that's now been absorbed into a bigger organisation called Place to Be. Um, and they have a number of art rooms throughout our county. But having met the primary school head teacher who was currently hosting The Art Room for our town, Dickot, she needed to have that class in back because she had a bold year group coming through. Um, and the art room were going to be homeless. So I basically met with them and offered them um, a classroom in our school. We had um, a whole suite of um, DT and engineering rooms for our proposed Key Stage 4 curriculum offer. So I basically said that for three years they could have one of the DT rooms and, to, and kit it out. Um, they then could offer the art therapy sessions to all of the local schools. But in exchange, we had um, two slots a week where our children could go for a focused art therapy session too. Other stakeholder groups we were conscious we really needed to work with was that we had a lot of um, bespoke personalised programmes to work with the whole child, but actually we should talk about whole person, whole human kind of approaches here. Um, we had parents of children with SEND who also had their own sort of unique needs. Um, we had a lot of a lot of parents um, supporting children with quite significant complex mental health needs. So we set up a number of parent and carer groups led by staff, co-partnered with a kind of a lead parent, um, just to create those opportunities and those safe spaces and those support networks for the parents and carers in our community too. I'm a big one for sort of community outreach and because we were a new school in a new development and it's the biggest housing development in Europe um, and literally backing onto our school grounds, we had um, a retirement home. We worked with um, Abby, who was the Arts Council lead um, for the development. And when you have new housing developments, there's usually a big pot of money set aside. Um, for community art projects. So we came up with an idea of doing an intergenerational art project where we involved the retirees from next door to come and work with our children. Um, and you can see just on the wall behind them, they created these three beautiful mosaics, working with Claire, the ladies in the middle, the artist. Um, and it just really brought together a sense of community cohesion um, within the school, beyond the school um, and within the local community. But, um, because we were doing so much work around mental health and wellbeing as our, kind of our core foundations and culture and ethos within the school, and I brought with me um, partnerships and um, collaborations from my previous roles in, in London, 
um, I was approached by the Charlie Waller Trust, who are a mental health foundation, that they had some money to set up a regional mental health and wellbeing network in Oxfordshire. And would I be happy to be the budget holder and use the money to put on a programme, a series of free training events? So I lapped it up and said, yes, please, very much. Um, and we had a pot of money that over the course of a year, we held a conference, a half day conference, a series of um, training programs such as training up a teacher in every school to be a mindfulness lead, a thrive lead. Um, and then we had a networking opportunity every six weeks where anyone who cared about mental health and well-being, so teachers, nurses, social workers, charity workers, mindfulness practitioners, parents could come together. Um, the legacy of that is that three years on, it's still going strong. I still run it, even though I'm no longer the head at the school. Um, and Lucinda, who was a teacher who had left the system to become a mental health and wellbeing consultant locally, co-leads it with me. And we are really keeping um, a very coherent, cohesive kind of network going of people sharing best practice. Out of um, that networking, um, that network was growing, we met the lovely Richard Venables, who was the High Sheriff of Oxfordshire. Um, this is two years ago now. Um, and his project for the year was the Black Dog. And it was all about raising um, mental health um, issues and awareness in, in the community. So this Black Dog figure here came and spent um, a month with us. It was positioned in our reception. The idea was that it's a conversation starter. You can go and pet it, you can talk to it, or you can just open up that conversation about mental health. And here are our student mental health ambassadors. We co-partnered with um, Oxford Mind and Oxford Youth, who launched a Youth in Mind conference, which is an annual mental health and wellbeing conference for students in Oxfordshire. It's in its second year, and this is the first year of the event. And our lovely students were the MCs and compared the whole event and taught 300 adults how to do um, mindful breathing using um, their fingers going up and down each finger, um, breathing in, breathing out. Um, very, very special moment, but a brilliant opportunity for them to really show that student leaders can also lead a culture of mental health and well-being. So I think a lot of um, everything I've talked about here is about sort of like how to grasp opportunities, how to change the way we do things to get a different outcome. But it's also about what is the desired impact and, and what is the legacy you're creating. Um, we talked a lot um, about how we could create a self-care toolkit. Rather than um, being a school and a society where we are reactive and responsive to crises, and I've, I've seen it in so many schools I've worked at, where a year 10 gets stressed or anxious or starts self-harming in year, in year 10, basically given yoga for six weeks or some therapy for a couple of weeks. Um, I really think that's a universal entitlement and every single person in the building in a school community should have those resources and those and those tools to draw on. So we tried to go for the kind of the cup, the cup half full rather than the cup half empty approach where um, or the bucket, however you want to see it, where we were um, nurturing and developing these skills and resources for when they need them in their life, as opposed to trying to um, sort of catch up when things go wrong. So this is a phrase that my deputy head used. Um, she actually said, rather than talking about mental health, we should talk about mental wealth. Um, our, our cultural ethos was underpinned by values. And actually, we can add values to our lives, to our mental health by sort of like reframing it as we want to be mentally wealthy human beings. All the work we did over um, the first two years of opening, um, and it was very much driven by Julie here, who I'm in the picture with, um, was working towards achieving the Mental Health and Schools Award. Um, it's a framework you can use from the Carnegie Centre, which is based at the Leeds Beckett University, um, and it gives you a strategic approach um, to self-evaluate the impact of your mental health and wellbeing culture. So it doesn't really tell you what to do, but it tells you how to assess what, what your implementation is. So this was us um, going to the award ceremony in London that place to be hosted. We were the first school in the whole of Oxfordshire to get the gold award. We are only one of six secondary schools in the whole country to get the gold award. Very, very proud moment um, for, uh, for, the, for the work we did to be recognised publicly. 
other awards that we also achieved in those first couple of years, because I think all these awards actually align with one another. We built into our global citizenship lessons, the Rights Respect Team Schools Award with UNICEF, thinking about the rights of the child. Um, I mentioned earlier on, we had a safe space for LGBTQI children. Um, we worked with a brilliant organisation, um, Dr Ellie Barnes and the team at Educate and Celebrate, which is about consciously thinking about the things we do in a school to make our schools inclusive for all. Um, thinking about uniform, thinking about language, thinking about toilets, etc. to make sure that everybody's identity is celebrated. Um, because wellbeing is obviously and mental health have been a big kind of focus point in the educational rhetoric over the last few years. Um, we were featured, we had case studies in quite a, quite a few books. So Andrew Cowley wrote a book called The Wellbeing Toolkit, an obvious um, school had a feature in there. Um, a good friend of mine, Claire Erasmus, who is a mental health and wellbeing lead, wrote a handbook for schools and we've got a chapter in there. And then Dr. Neil Hawkes, who is the founder of Values Based Education, which is another award we actually got. Um, he's got this um, concept and his wife Jane talk about the inner curriculum, that the outer curriculum is what we teach children in lesson time. But actually the inner curriculum is what we nurture in them at, at breaks, at lunch times, in clubs, before and after school, the kind of the wraparound of the holistic education I mentioned at the start. Um, so there's also um, a section in there that talks about our school and our provision and our vision. Um, all of this really um, framed how we did recruitment and not just recruitment of staff, but also recruitment of families who then would consider whether or not it was the right school for their child to come to. We very much wore our values as a badge of honour and we very much led with our commitment to a culture of mental health and wellbeing. Um, I was very candid in any presentation to staff and any presentation to parents and carers who were prospective members of our community. Um, about who we were and who we weren't. Um, and I would outline those non-negotiables, things that we didn't believe in, things that we would never do. Um, and if you want your kid to have a packed lunch, then don't send your kid to us. If you want your kid to do homework, it's not the school for you. Um, but what it meant was it, those parents and carers who did get us, got, really, really did get us. And it was a very strong um, engagement and partnership with those families who fully bought into their kids doing mindfulness, for example. I think what comes with that, though, is also a health warning. Um, perhaps naively, I didn't really anticipate the fact that because we did so much around mental health and well-being, we then attracted a lot of people with significant issues um, who wanted to join our community. Um, we had a lot of teachers who would have left the system. They were broken. Um, they wanted to um, escape the broken school system. Um, they were disillusioned and disenfranchised and they saw us as a beacon of hope, um, a ray of sunshine, and they wanted to come work with us. But they did bring with them quite a lot of emotional um, baggage and emotional needs that we needed to work through. And equally with the parents, um, parents with vulnerable children um, very much wanted their child to get into us. Just an example of the kind of the stats we're talking about. We had 240 in a year group and in one year, um, we had 24 applications for children with EHCPs or statements to come to the school, which would mean that 10% of our year group had an EHCP, which is just um, a very warped um, curve. So we had to really think carefully about like, how many of the complex needs we, we could actually meet. We also had a lot of in-year transfers um, requests from families of children who just weren't coping in other mainstream environments. So. Like we were very proud of what we did. We had to be realistic about we couldn't spread ourselves too thin. We were a very small team as well. So that is the Whistle Stop Tour in um, 24 minutes, I think I've taken, just really talking about um, the journey we went on, the vision we had, how that vision manifested um, strategically into the provision and how that provision impacted um, the community that we work with. Thank you very much for listening. Please feel free to contact me on my Twitter handle, ethical underscore leader.